Electricity is our most important resource. Every single segment of the economy is completely reliant on it, and pretty much everybody is using it 24-7. The job of keeping the lights on everywhere all the time is done by about 10,000 people, and this is how they do it. First up, generation. It all starts here at a power plant like Westwind. 80% of New Zealand's generation comes from hydro, with the other 20% going from geothermal, wind and fossil fuel. We have two major generation regions, the Lower South Island and the Central North Island. The Lower South Island is amazing for hydro because it's got loads of big rivers and big lakes all coming down from the Southern Alps. Central North Island is also really good for hydro thanks to Lake Taupo, Mount Ruapehu, the Whanganui River and the Waikato River. But it's also got loads of geothermal capacity, in fact almost all of the geothermal capacity in the entire country. All generation of any real size is owned by these five companies, three of which are majoritively owned by the government. The amount of people required to actually run the power plants is surprisingly low. Meridian generates 30% of electricity, yet only employ 92 people to run the power plants. Compared to the rest of the system, generation is pretty simple, so enjoy that whilst it lasts, because now we have the system operator. This is where we introduce the government agency, Transpower. Transpower's job is to keep a balance between generation and demand. They do this by collecting a whole load of data and using that to make predictions on generation and demand. The demand side of this is also partially contracted out to a company called Tesla. No, not that Tesla. <laughs> a different Tesla. They predict this a really long way out. The system operator is also responsible for running the wholesale electricity market. This market works by splitting every day up into half hour increments. A week before a given half hour increment, Transpower will start taking bids and offers. Bids are a retailer, somebody who's going to be using the electricity saying, hey, I'm going to need this much electricity and I'm going to need it for this price. An offer is a generator. They're saying, I can generate this much electricity and I'm willing to do it for this price. In the week leading up to any given interval, Transpower will work with generators to ensure that enough power is generated to meet demand. Transpower then pays everybody who generated power for that interval the highest price that they had to accept. This is kind of a funny system because it causes massive spikes in electricity price whenever we have to turn on a fossil fuel plant. And because it's so infrequent that we have to do that, the fossil fuel generators have to boost the price up even more when they are allowed to generate. This then means that other power companies that are producing in that time period get paid low, and then they can sell the power the rest of the time for almost nothing in a race to the bottom. This leads to basically a bipolar electricity system where a lot of the time it's at 0.01 cents and a lot of the time it's at hundreds of dollars. Now that we've worked out who is generating our power and when, we need to get it to the consumer and we do that with Transmission. Transmission is linking our major generation assets to substations in cities around the country. This is done by a government agency called Transpower, but it legally has to operate completely separately to the system operator. They even have different boards, which kind of begs the question as to why they're in the same department, but anyway. Transpower's transmission assets cost $7.7 .7 billion to build, almost entirely in substations and transmission lines. Most of their lines are 110 kilovolts or 220 kilovolts, with some old lower voltage lines and a 350 kilovolt DC cable going from the Lower South Island to Wellington and a 400 kilovolt AC cable going from the Central North Island to Auckland, linking our two major generation regions to major population centres. Transpower contracts the maintenance of these lines out to four different companies in six different regions. These are some of the only foreign companies you'll see on our energy system. Once the power reaches the substation, it's passed on to a distributor. Distributors. <laughs> <laughs> distributors are so complicated. I'd read like a hundred PDFs just to understand them well enough for this video. And there's so much more I still don't understand. I might have to make another video about them in the future. <sighs> anyway. Here are distributors. A distributor's job is to distribute power from transfer substations through lines, transformers, and smaller substations to consumers. They're often also called lines companies, EDCs, or EDBs. That's it. That's all they do. So why is this so complicated? Well, there are 29 distributors across the entire country, each with effectively a regional monopoly. The regions they each have are super messy. I'm not going to go through the history of it and how this came to be, but I am going to show you how crazy it is. Let's start with Powerco. They're the biggest distributor by land area and they manage the lines in Taranaki, the Wairapa and the Manawatu. And the Coromandel, for some reason, even though that's nowhere near and completely disconnected. Aurora is also split into two, the Needham and Queenstown Lakes. The country in the middle that manages Central Otago is called OtagoNet. And it's owned by two other distributors, 75% by the power company and 25% by Invercargill Electric. Invercargill Electric and the power company also 50% own PowerNet, which is a company that manages all three distributors. PowerNet also manages the lines for Stewart Island and for part of what should be a road area under the Lakeland network. I'm not sure if this is a contract or something like that and it's not its own distributor. I really don't know what's going on here. Also, the power company, all time name. There's also the lines company in the North Island, which is just as good. North Power, one of the most interesting because they're also a transmission line maintainer, but not in the area in which they distribute for some reason. 
Other lines companies also contract them to do line maintenance for them. All distributors are regulated by the Commerce Commission. They're regulated under what's called price quality regulation, where they've got a cap on how much revenue they can earn, and they've also got to keep a certain level of uptime and a certain lack of outages. The only numbers I could find on this were from 2015 to 2020 for some reason. Most companies pass these every single year, except for Vector who failed from 2015 to 2020 in the quality area, and Aurora who failed from 2016 to 2020 in the quality area. There are 12 distributors that actually aren't under this regulation, and that's because they meet the standard for community ownership. This means that their ownership structure is such that 90% of the community they serve benefits from the profits that these distributors make, either by direct money or by community projects. It's weird that these guys are also exempted from quality regulation. I don't know, it seems weird to me, although looking at the numbers, it doesn't really seem to have an effect on how many outages they get. One funny thing about this is that because North Power counts as community owned, the revenues from maintaining the transmission lines here legally have to benefit the people who live here. <laughs> All distributors are under what's called Electricity Networks Aotearoa, or the ENA. This is kind of the industry body for distributors and it also allows them to communicate. And that's it. We're done with distributors. That wasn't so hard, was it? And now we have consumption. Consumption is where you get involved. Once the power reaches your house, it goes through a meter. There are two types of meters, analog meters and smart meters. Analog meters have to be read by somebody every two months, normally somebody from Wells. This is really slow and expensive. That's why analog meters are being replaced by smart meters. Smart meters track power in half hour increments and then transmit that data wirelessly over the cell phone network. This has allowed for huge innovation in the electricity sector, creating things like three hours of power and like PowerShop's entire business model. A huge majority of houses have smart meters these days. Each meter is associated with an installation control point number or an ICP number. The ICP number's job is to act as kind of a physical to digital connection and allow the power company to know whose data is whose. I'll put a link in the description where you can find your ICP or the ICP of anybody else, and also the retailer anybody else is with, but we're the public. Now it's time for retailers. Meter data goes to retailers. A retailer is who you'll think of as your power company. Retailers charge you for electricity and then they buy that electricity back from the wholesale market. Or if you're also a generator, you can just do a thing called internal transfer where you kind of give yourself the power. This has led to a market where there are a bunch of retailers, but almost all of them are either generators or owned by generators. There's not a whole lot to distinguish one retailer from another, but they can offer deals or packages with Wi-Fi or gas. Overall though, it's a very simple part of the industry, partially because of regulation. Regulation is done by the Electricity Authority. I don't think I can tell you anything more about what they do without being extraordinarily boring. So I'll leave it there, making this the final graphic. This video has taken me seven months to make, but I'm done. I'm finally free.